Okay, great. Um, thanks everyone, it's, it's great to be here. My name is Ryan Whittem. I'm the CEO of Paper Curve. We are based in Toronto, Canada, and we are an uh, enterprise SaaS company serving pharma, biotech, and medical devices. And um, we're really the, the premier software solution provider um, in the space. Um, we help with all types of content needs. Um, so we have a specific process called the Medical Legal Regulatory Review, which um, we really, that's how we got started. And then from there, we really expanded into a lot of different areas in the business, um, sales enablement teams, medical science liaisons, um, contract life cycle, um, all things that revolve around people and process and documents and collaboration. Um, and then, you know, really making sure we had specific uh, solutions for uh, life sciences, uh, you know, built on the solution. Um, and then from there, we've we really, uh, last year, we uh, built a whole AI solution. So um, really to better understand the text and content in documents, um, help with making associations to content and relationships, um, understand content, and, you know, make connections that um, would otherwise be really manual um, in the space. So uh, that's a really high level uh, overview about uh, our solution. Let's see if I can. Um, so, you know, what we, what we really wanted to do was, um, you know, one thing that was really important uh, about paper curve and the, and the solution that we have is we wanted to make sure that we had really good team adoption. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of solutions in the space, you know, that we saw in our competitors, we heard a lot of sort of horror stories of people not using the software, the very expensive solutions. Um, you know, you have turnover in the space and that's part of what I want to talk to, uh, all of you uh, today. So the problem with enterprise software is that people don't use it. Uh, um, so, uh, not just in not just in health and health tech, but you know all over uh, the space. There's uh, actually 60% of uh, licenses are used, so that means 40% of these software licenses are unused. Um, so, which is a pretty staggering figure, uh, considering the millions of dollars that are spent. So, even a small company, less than a thousand uh, people, they're spending you know upwards of 15 million dollars a year on software licenses. So pretty staggering um, figure to understand uh, when you think about it that this much money is just being wasted um, and so you know we we not only sought to make sure that we didn't want to have that problem with our own software um, you know strictly for first of all we want to bring people value but uh, second of all uh, we we thought it was important for our own survival um, if, if it became came to light that our software wasn't being used you know we don't want to lose clients over it they say actually no one's really using this so um we from the beginning made sure that uh, you know we were we were tracking it and monitoring and making sure people are getting value through a number of uh tactics which i'll get into later um but let's talk about why why is so much software um that when you go to work your software is so bad um, whereas you know at home and your personal life on your phone um, you know, apps uh, get better and better and easier to use. Um, I'll, I'll you start with a really, uh, uh, I'll start with a really uh, sort of extreme example. So uh, what we see is important systems and processes are really design failures. So this screenshot is a screen for uh, the uh, uh, alerts that go to smartphones for the state of Hawaii. And this is what somebody's job was to, uh, you know, to manage this. And um, and so obviously a lot of work I'm sure went into redundancy and backups and standard operating procedures, but nobody put a lot of work into the usability, you know, given this screen. And so what happened was, um, you, know, there's, you can see some of the messages are about landslides or Amber Alerts, things that you might be familiar with, but there was one uh, that is for a, uh, missile strike and a ballistic missile threat went out to millions of people on the uh, entire uh, island of Hawaii, uh, causing a bit of panic. Uh, some messages from mom came in saying, uh, honey, take shelter. And, uh, you know, it was a, a big mistake. And so, you know, and you're like, oh, what, 
you know, this is a human failure, but it's not. It's really a, a software failure. Um, you can't expect people to, um, you know, to be successful if the two options uh, they're given just the only difference is drill. Um, so you're, you're one click away from sort of disaster. So obviously this is an extreme example, and I, obviously you know I would hope commercial products don't have interfaces that are this bad, but it does sort of illustrate the point that we don't prioritize um, usability and experience and adoption when it comes to software when it comes to work the same way that uh, we do in uh, consumer in consumer apps. And uh, it, it was a problem. Um, another way uh, that I can kind of illustrate the point was this is a survey from uh, Open Text, and um, it was our, it was in our world of, of the software. They were saying, um, "What's your most important feature?" And, you know, this is where I got the title for this talk. And you know, right at the top was ease of use, user adoption. It wasn't search. It wasn't you know processes. It wasn't analytics. It was user adoption. So. What that tells me is that people actually know there's a problem. The, the people that make these decisions, the business owners, they know that there's a huge problem uh, with, with, uh, with using these things. Um, so then it gets into like, is usability really a feature? I mean, we've got this list of features. Um, you know, what, what makes ease of use really a feature and what does that really even mean? Um, so let's look at why does adoption fail in the first place. Um, so um, number one is just poor usability. You know, I've got some random you know screenshots here of, of uh, enterprise software, and we just say, look, usability doesn't matter when it comes when you go to work, and that just can't be true. Um, we've got uh, you know. All of these things that require training and, and uh, you know, say, don't, don't worry, we're just going to send you to this, you know, one day training or take all these, you know, webinars or there's all this, um, you know, documentation. The way I, I would look at this and frame it is, um, you know, would you do the same? Would Facebook do the same thing? Would Facebook say, uh, you know, to use our app, you need to take this course? Or uh, you know all of that. So you know if they had done, if, if they had had that sort of uh, criteria, uh, they would fail. So they need to make sure that you know people my, my parents' age can use it without any training. And you know let's be honest, it's actually a fairly complex app, especially especially now. There's a lot of different functions, a lot of features, and nobody trained the billions of people to use the Facebook app. Um, and so you know we can't make these excuses that oh well for work it's different you need to have all this training and you need to you know take this course so it's just not it's just not realistic so i think that's that's one um and so to combat this what we see is uh, managers to the rescue it's the carrot and the stick so they say no problem uh you don't want to use it we're gonna we're gonna mandate it and you know, everybody needs to use this software and this is how you use it. And, you know, that's that's how we'll get our, our adoption up. And don't get me wrong, like, at times, Paper Curve has benefited from this. You know, when it comes from the top saying, look, Paper Curve is the standard for this and you're going you're gonna to have to use it. Um, obviously, we see our adoption go pretty high, but um, that's, you can't rely on that, especially as a business and you know, to the other people on, on this call with, with businesses. If you uh, if you rely on that, it takes a long time to get that level of traction and to get that, that um, buy-in from stakeholders. So um, relying on managers to, you know, force it down, you know, it's not really a good uh, you know, strategy for success. Um, the other thing that we see is why does it fail is login fatigue. Um, so a, a survey, uh, uh, a, a recent survey from a company called Zillow uh, that the average, uh, on average, there's 217 SaaS applications in a 1,000-person uh, company or less. So um, really, the num it just tells us that the number of applications has exploded. And so, you know, to, to sign into yet another application, to remember the password and, you know, all of that, even if you had SSO, it, it's a lot of, it, there is a lot of log login fatigue. Um, and, you know, that has come... You know, over time, as 
more and more SaaS applications do more niche things rather than behemoths. Um, that has come as a larger shift in uh, enterprises where uh, the power is going from IT departments to more teams who can, you know, you know, pay for things on their own and and you know leave IT out of it, which is you know which is our uh, goal as well. You know, obviously we're happy to talk to IT when it comes to um, our security and, and other things, but when it comes to who's making the business case um, for the application and who's going to actually be using it, you know, typically it's the leader of of that team. It's someone up there in, in regulatory or compliance or legal. Um, or you know, possibly operations. It's not IT people making those decisions. So that has led to so many more applications being in this com uh, in these companies. Uh, really, a staggering uh, number. So, so why does you know, you know why does uh, adoption fail? It's it's too many logins. Turnover. So uh, there. You know, not just recently, not, uh, you know, just in the pandemic world, but even before that, um, turnover was really increasing. We're seeing it getting um, even worse. Uh, from our own data, we can, we can see that 25% of employees turn over in the last year, which, you know, when we say to our clients, you know, you realize that you know, we can give them the stats because we can see it in the, in the user deactivations. You realize how many, you know, how many of your employees have turned over last year. It's a pretty high number. They say no, no, it's it's not that high. <laughs> then we can give them the data, and they're they're blown away. And so, when you have that kind of turnover, it means that you know if you went to this huge lift to get some trained up in using it and uh, seeing the value um, and understanding maybe the more nuanced parts of of your app, um, if you suddenly lose that employee, you have to start at zero. Um, you're you're starting at the beginning, and you know at times we've had companies where you know. Um, there's a lot of turnover. There's a lot of a lot of people leaving all at once, and then you lose your key stakeholders that really understand you know the nuances. And so we're seeing our customer success teams, you know, almost starting at zero in some companies because uh, of turnover. And so if you, uh, you know, if you don't have an application that's easy to get into, to understand the value, to uh, you know get value out of the application, you know, right away and immediately. Uh, you're not going to see high adoption, you're not. Uh, and so, you know, the turnover is forcing us even more to focus on, uh, you know, ease of use and adoption. So let's talk about uh, how to fix it. Uh, so one of the things uh, that we do is uh, test the users. So uh, there's a couple ways that we can do this. Um, often, you know, our customer success team, who uh, they're awesome, they really built um, deep and strong relationships with our clients, particularly key key stakeholders, people that use the application a lot. Um, if we are working on something new, we'll make sure we get out early and um, walk them through it, uh, get them to test it, um, get their feedback. Are we? Is it, is it clear? Do they understand the value? Um, that. You know, it's really important that we uh, get out to them early. The other way you can approach it, um, especially if you don't have a lot of clients, is you can, uh, you know, test with strangers. So you can pay people. You know, when we started the company, um, I would go on LinkedIn and just find the people that are the right role for our application, and I would say, you know, I'll give you fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, or whatever, um, for you know, half an hour, an hour of your time. And get them hands on with the prototype, get them clicking through the flow. Um, so, we would do this with Zoom, you know, it's pretty low tech. We'd record it so that we had it. And um, it's amazing what you would uncover, um, you know, when you got that feedback from users. Uh, you really understand where the weak points in your application were. Um, it, you know, often, you know, it wasn't that your designer wasn't awesome, it was uh, often wording. Maybe wording is unfair. Uh, it could be could be the title. It could be helper text. It could be they get stuck. Um, so to really make sure that your interface is uh, you know clear that the user flow is uh, straightforward and that the value is obvious you know from the beginning. Um, and if, and if it's not, they're going to tell you. So um, there's a couple uh, practical ways you can do this. So like I said, if you have 
um, you know, friendly people that you know you can call up and get their time. Um, if you have to pay them, you know, do that. Um, but if you don't, there's platforms out there that will play sort of matchmaker for you. Um, I use Playbook UX, which, um, you know, you can basically, uh, you know, they have a huge pool of tens of thousands of possibly hundreds of thousands of users who are willing to um, get paid a small amount of money for, uh, uh, for their time. And they will, um, you know, help recruit users and they can uh, walk through a series of steps um, uh, of tasks they need to complete. And then they'll sort of um, speak out loud as they do that work. Uh, so you'll, you'll say, okay, that was easy or that, didn't, that wasn't totally obvious. You can see where people get lost. Um, also, usertesting.com, um, those uh, usertesting.com, you know, I've used at larger organizations. It's uh, fairly expensive, but good if you have a, a bigger operation. So, um, yeah. so testing with users. Um, this, this is something that you can do with uh, features that are brand new and yet to come out. Or if you feel like there are failures in your current application, you can always just take your current app and, and see how people go through the process and see where the weak points are. Um, so test with users. Sip of water. Measure it. So um, you need to track the things that matter in your application to know if it's getting better or worse. So for us, uh, there's a lot. Uh, we are a uh, you know document, video, content collaboration platform. So the types of things that we track are uh, things like uploads, things like comments. Uh, it's where our customers are getting value out of the platform, and we need to make sure that those things are trending up or trending down. Um, otherwise, we know we have a problem. Uh, we use a number of tools. Uh, we use, um, you know, uh, uh, this BI tools that connect directly to our databases. We use uh, Mixpanel is a great uh, analytics platform. Um, there are others, so I'm not here to plug one or the other, but that's what works for us. Um, so that's one thing to measure. So you're really measuring user interactions, things they do, to see um, what's working and what's not. And then the, the great thing about that is you've got a baseline, and then if you make a change to the application, that change could be to the application or promoting it or um, doing other things to see if you can move the needle. You see if that metric goes up, which is really, really critical. Um, the other thing you can measure is uh, we use Net Promoter Score. So it's a survey that goes out to uh, users, a very simple survey. It's on a scale of 1 to 10, would you recommend Paper Curve to a friend? Um, we have it pop up in app. We try it on email. Um, and um, not only do you get that score, but where we actually you really see the, the greatest value is some of the comments that we get about how certain things or maybe uh, we could improve. Um, so um, it's good to get that numerical score to see is that number trending up or down or flat. Um, but uh, there's a gold mine of uh, you know, qualitative data from that measure. Talk to customers. Um, so like I said before, uh, customer success is a critical part of our, our company at Paper Curve. And uh, they set up recurring meetings with, you know, uh, you know call them power users. Uh, some people don't like that term. Um, I've, I've grown to uh, accept it. But uh, it's the people that really use your application a lot. Uh, and those monthly meetings, we really learn a lot around what's working and what's not. And so on the right of the, of of the slide. Um, this is a Kanban board um, in JIRA. That's our customer success board. And each one of these tickets are feedback from clients. So if, they're, if they say, I'm having a problem uh, with this, or it'd be really great if I could have bold and italic in my comments, you know, that gets tracked and it gets uh, you know, uh, discussed on a biweekly meeting so we don't lose track of it. So it's it's great to talk to customers, but if you don't have a process to capture it and manage it, um, you might as well not bother. So uh, this is you know, another critical part to making sure that your experience is always getting better. Um, this helps us with our prioritization. Um, you know, often we get focused on the big features where sometimes the, there's feedback around something smaller or nuanced that we can slip in. But we always want to make sure we get done. So logging that feedback in a visible place for the team 
and making sure there is a ritual to uh, uh, to cover it and to discuss it and, and make sure those improvements are getting acted um, is is critical. Uh, now, one thing I'll say is we don't action every comment or feedback from clients. Something if something uh, seems to be at odds with other feedback or we're unsure, um, we we do have a monitor column where we uh, we make sure it's it's captured, but we we say we're not going to go ahead and just fix that. We're not going to fix everything that a client may say, um, but we might either get more information or see if other people have a similar feedback over time. Um, so, you know, one word of caution is yeah, don't 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 let every little piece of feedback you know, drive your roadmap on on your uh, on your application. Use it yourself. Uh, probably heard the term uh, "eat your own dog food," and um, yeah, we we actually for a long time we weren't really using it internally. Uh, we were using you know other applications. Then we realized like what if we aren't using it ourselves? How can we you know expect our clients you know to use it and love it and not you know do um, yeah you know do some of these tasks in other applications? So um, you know I mean. As soon as we started using it ourselves, we really got to understand maybe some of the feedback a lot better. Um, if, if people talk about a pain point in the application, we actually felt it. Or if something is raised, you could say, "Oh, you know what? I've, I've had a, a similar, you know, concern with that as well." So, you know, using it yourself, eating your own dog food, uh, you really better understand the strengths and weaknesses um, of your own of your own application. Um, the details matter. So, as applications grow, it gets easy to ignore um, edge cases or even um, some of the more you know, you know delightful parts of the application. And you know, I think when we first started, we're in a big hurry. Uh, but things like loading states, things like you know, small animations, some of the new ones that make things better. Um, they they do matter and they do add to an overall feeling that your uh, that your application is a great one and that paper is is uh, great to use. Um, it's it's everything from small interactions, hover states, um, every little bit counts. Um, the the photo I have on the screen here is of uh, the SpaceX Dragon uh, Crew Dragon capsule and. Um, I was watching the first crew mission, and I noticed that on all these touchscreens, these astronauts were touching it, and there were these beautiful animations from things moving from side to side. They had little 3D models that turned. All of the uh, software that was built for these astronauts, um, it was beautifully done. And what struck me is, you know, this was obviously the first mission. This is this was two astronauts. This interface was made for two people. And the, the care that went into making software for two people, um, especially things that weren't just functional, they were also you know aesthetic and um, you know made it sort of a pleasure to use. Uh, a, a lot of care went into it. And then even since then, there have only, by my count, been you know, 24 astronauts that have used this interface, this interface in space. And so, you know, especially if you're starting out, making sure. You know, if only a few users are using that feature, or um, only a few users are actually on your platform, making sure those details um, are are well thought out. So that means you know, loading states, empty states, error states, um, not just the straight through you know happy path. Making sure that it's really um, well, you know, well thought out and well conceived. Uh, here's another here's another shot of it, so you can just see. Um, you know the the, the beautiful uh, you know interface that these uh, astronauts get to use up in space. Uh, I saw a comparison to the uh, shuttle; it was just all switches. Uh, that's it. So, final thoughts. Um, so, software can only be valuable if people actually use it. So, if you know your application. If if only you know sixty percent of uh, you know the licenses you sold that client are being used, um, that's going to be a problem. Eventually, someone's going to figure it out and, and realize they're not getting the value for 
into that application. Um, and it's not enough to you know just hire the best designers and have a have a pretty interface. Um, it's 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 a grind from top to bottom. It involves you know all teams, not just not just designers. It's the designers to make it easy to use. It's the wording uh, that that is clear and concise that people get it. Um, it's your customer success and your marketing. Uh, you know, making sure people know about these features. Um, we ourselves, like me personally, I'm involved with getting one feature adopted. You know, more than it is. You know, it's it's something that you know we have a feature called compare versions. It just it's a simple you know comparison and it highlights the differences. And we you know by my in my mind the adoption was not high enough. So I'm you know getting at the pounding the pavement, making sure users know about it and know. Uh, you know, understand the value and, and how to get there. So um, it's, it doesn't work if you just build the software and nobody uses it. Um, you need to listen to your customers. Uh, you need to measure uh, how how the application is performing and you need to iterate. Um, typically, you know, you don't get everything right the first time. And so um, that feature, that part of your application is only going to get better you know, once you've iterated and you've taken the data, you've heard from customers, you've seen the data, and you've made changes to iterate things better. And then the last thing is software really needs to disappear. Uh, this image is of a, uh, you know, a, a voice-controlled, you know, a, a, uh, appliance where, you know, hey Siri, hey Google, that's that's the ultimate in software disappears. It's not an interface. It's easy to use. Uh, my grandparents can use it. And so that's where things are going. Um, you know, it's not just voice control, but in applications that, you know, on smartphones and, and other things. If you just don't think about the software, just think about what you're trying to do and the goal and the task that you're doing, um, that's how you're going to lead to bringing value to customers and uh, bringing value to customers and, you know, making sure that they, they want to use the application uh, every day. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you a lot for your time. It's really been uh, and uh, open up to any questions. Hey, Daddy. Thank you, thank you for that, Ryan. Uh, that was awesome. I definitely have a fair share of questions, but we'll see uh, if the audience does have any first. Um, so you're in Toronto right now. Is that where y'all yep. are based out of? Yeah, we're in Toronto, Canada. Yes. Um, I mean, yeah, I will say we are a bit spread out across Canada. We have people in uh, yeah different provinces as well, but most of us are in Toronto. That's amazing. So, you know, um, for me, while we wait for some questions to come in, you know, as far as software and stuff, you know, the user usability is a key factor for me. You know, when I look into software, even though I run an, I help run an accelerator here in Dallas. So what can, it's a two, full, two part question. What can customers do to kind of, you know, a lot, I think for me, I like to figure it out on my own. So offering, you know, self-serving and like kind of do it yourself, do it with you or do it for you type of um, customer support because everyone, you know, just learns and applies technology differently. So what is your recommendation or, you know, what do you think customers should be doing to communicate that with the companies? And in exchange, what can companies be doing more or differently with customers when it comes to like onboarding and activating them? Sure, great question. Um, so definitely when we get a new customer, we see someone's joined, our customer success will reach out and say, hey, you know, we saw you just joined or especially with the new cu customer overall, like, you know, we're, we do, you know, free unlimited trading. That's part of our, our core values. We don't, you know, charge extra for that because we want people to, to get the value, right? So mm -hmm. we, we offer, you know, training and then we make sure that there's maybe different tiers. So if you're sort of a light user, you only need this little corner of the application. That's a, a very, you know, short 15 minutes, you know, type of thing. If you're an admin, you're managing users or you're really setting up, you know, more complex things, you're setting up workflows and libraries, the, the more complex parts, that's, you know, a little more. They're the key stakeholder. And we'll spend, you know, whatever whatever it takes. You know, often we're taking their, their SOP and, and translating it. But, but we offer, like that, that's a baseline. Um, so there's training. We also have live chat. So in the top right corner of our application all the time, uh, you click chat, it'll, um, 
it'll come in. And um, we have processes in the company that, um, you know, if, if you know, uh, somebody doesn't answer, you know, if it goes down the line till, till somebody is there, it'll pop on my, on my phone personally. So if it's like 11 o'clock at night um, or, you know, some of my other partners, somebody will respond. Um, we obviously, you know, we, we obviously are there nine to five, but we really strive to really answer whenever somebody uh, can. Uh, you know, also we have uh, uh, customers from all over the world. So, you know, with time zones issues, um, you know, it, it may be, uh, it may be the middle of the night. So we, we try to do our best, um, but yeah, chat, live chat, that uh, really helps. Uh, that's another, uh, we have marketing that goes out. So we have product update emails that go out. Um, sort of highlight our new features and uh, the types of things that we do. And um, yeah, I would say that's sort of the three things that we really do. But what, one thing I will say is you you can't always rely on somebody taking that training meeting. That's that's why, I said that, you know, a, a lot of this was you, you can't rely on somebody taking that meeting because we see lots of users. They're like, maybe they're like you, right? Like I'm more of a self-serve guy. I don't really want to do the training. I just want to poke around and, and try it out. So you have to make sure that it's a bit of a, a crutch to rely on training completely. It has to work on its own, um, you know, without without any training. It has to be obvious. Um, you know, we, we just do that uh, to make sure that, you know, for those people that like to learn that way, that that's available to them. But there's always going to be different people that like to learn in different ways. So. Awesome. Thank you for that. That was great. Um, while we wait, you know, there's no questions. We do have a little bit of extra time since we did finish early. Where can people find you? Where can they connect with you online or offline? Uh, yeah, so uh, papercurve.com uh, is our website. And uh, you can uh, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you know what? I think I have my first slide. Have my info. Uh, but no, I didn't. We can, uh, I can get with the mods and we can share it, but they could probably just find you on LinkedIn. Are you on LinkedIn, Twitter? What's your platform of choice? Uh, LinkedIn is our number one. We do have Twitter, so we're uh, at papercurve. And then my email's here, ryan.wooden at papercurve.com if you want to shoot me a note. So uh, I'm always available. Uh, awesome. So last question that I got for you, I mean, if, if it's okay. Uh, really? What is your prediction for 2023? You know, what, what is a prediction that you have for 2023 with healthcare, IT, and, and, and just kind of some of the things that you are seeing in your field? Um, so, yeah, it, in my field, I, I think the macro thing that we'll continue to see um, in, the, in the pandemic, what we saw is the, the power move. I did touch on this move from IT departments to individual, you know, divisions, teams to make their software choices. Um, I think that's there's good and bad to that. I think it's good for companies like paper curve because we're typically the incumbent we're trying to go up against you know a, a big giant player you know um, a big behemoth in the industry whereas um you know the, it's very relationship based if you're those big uh, incumbent players but for us you know we want to compete on on the value we bring and so uh, the shift from decision makers who get software from it to go to the departments um is one that will continue um and and uh, I don't have the exact stat, but it, uh, it did move, you know, significantly uh, over the last year or two. And I expect that trend to continue. Um, I think the other trend I would say uh, is that uh, AI, AI machine learning, which we do a lot of, um, and we do a number of different things. Uh, you know, we have a number of different features that do different things in the application. We'll move from sort of like theoretical or buzzwords to um, actually being used, you know, as a, as a default more and more and not um, sort of a, a gold star feature that's sort of nice to have or, you know, a, a bit of a buzzword. Um, you're really starting to see the practical application come down. Um, the cost is coming down. It's really part of the default tool set. And so um, I think that if you're a challenger in the space, it's an opportunity because, you know, you can build these tools, you know, a lot a lot faster and easier and cheap, cheap, cheaper than you could have, you know, three, four, five years ago. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it being part of the default, you know, part of uh, your application will uh, will be critical. Um, I think what comes along with that is that your interface is different. You know, at the end, I talked about, uh, you know, the you know the voice control. Um, you know, uh, 
you know, speakers that we all have in our homes. And, but, you know, that's, this is that type of an, an interface. Um, it, it changes your, your user interface on a, on a desktop application or a phone application. Um, so, you know, for us, we're getting recommendations surfaced, uh, you know, rather than having to search. So it's very sort of web, web 1.0, or web 2.0 to search for what you're looking for. It's something, uh, you know, different and, and better and probably more accurate to say, hey, here's, here's, I think this is what you're looking for. Based on this, we think you're looking for this. Um, and then having that human, um, you know, uh, confirm that that selection is correct. So, um, you know, whether it's recommendations or it's um, uh, uh, translation, whether it's classifying, uh, you know, things into different groups, you know, all of these uh, types of machine learning and AI will become, you know, really the default and, and really challenge the incumbents to innovate or die. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's really interesting. A lot of people have talked, you know, yesterday um, about AI and how it's being used in, in their companies. And I think it's really interesting because a lot of people are looking, you know, people that are not utilizing AI right now or maybe don't even have to don't realize that it's not really AI is not really there to replace your job. It's just to make you smarter, more efficient, right? Eliminate more of that human error um, in order for you to, you know, either save time, money. Uh, so I think it's really interesting what AI is doing and, you know, especially in healthcare, which is like, I mean, that could be the difference between, you know, and this is extreme, but like life and death, like in making decisions at a more rapid pace um, and accelerated, you know, now you don't need to take in all this data and like, you know, put it in a warehouse and, and find it, you know, you can find ways to, to, you know, expedite that process, you know, so that's just one of, I have very little knowledge in AI, but from what I know, you know, it's, it's really there to make you more efficient. You know, AI can't, doesn't have like, you know, emotion. So it can't, it can't correlate like a, a human being yet, at least, you know, so uh, maybe those decisions should be let for humans. Uh, but at least it can recommend, like you said, and advise you on, on the best um, route that you can take. Well, you make a good point about, about, particularly in health, right? Um, there's a real reluctance to say, let the machines take over. So, and that could be anything. It could be, uh, you know, are you really going to trust AI to, you know, identify, you know, cancer in, a, in, a, a, in an imaging? Or uh, in, in my world, you know, we've got a lot of compliance people. Are you really going to trust the AI to make the decision? And it's like, well, well no, I, I don't think that, that's not where we are yet. Right now it's AI assisted. Um, so it's not AI, AI making the decision. So um, what, what we're gonna still continue to see, I think for quite a while is AI assisted saying, I, I probably found the right thing you can have a human confirm or also making sure that, that a human doesn't miss it. Um, and so, you know, it does, it is a huge difference to, um, uh, to folks in their jobs in all the different areas of health. But uh, that reluctance to have AI make the decision, I think, will continue um, for quite some time. Yeah, I agree. Yesterday, um, one of the speakers, Dr. Michelle, she has, I think it's I, I, IVF is the what they're working on, but they're using AI and the AI is helping with the imaging to like detect. I thought it was extremely fascinating to detect, you know, uh, the good embryos faster, right? And be able to kind of, you know, match up the good ones so people don't have to go through the process of failure, you know, when trying to get pregnant. So I thought that was really cool. And, and obviously, um, healthcare is not something that's going away anytime soon. And it's probably one of the biggest, you know, I think, industries that's lacking a little bit on innovation, um, a lot of opportunity, you know, not only just in IT, but in other, you know, sectors within eye care. So thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Uh, any last parting words Where? before we let you go? Um, no, I think that's about it. <laughs> Thanks so much uh, for having awesome. me Great to be here. And uh, yeah, you can uh, you know catch, catch me by email or LinkedIn. Thank you. Thanks for having Sounds me. good. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. You too. Bye.